So welcome to this edition of CNN Solve. Today, we're talking with Connor Calais, who's an application specialist at Hubbard Hall. And our topic today is going to be phosphate, specifically today, zinc and manganese. I'm Tim Pennington, and you're listening to CNN Solve, brought to you by Hubbard Hall. Better results, less chemistry. Connor, how are you doing today? Doing well. How are you? Good, good. Uh, first of all, let's start off with the real quick. 101 question. Talk about phosphates in general. Uh, ex explain what those are uh, and, and how finishers are using those. So phosphates kind of fall under the class of a pretreatment application. Um, it's where you're going to take like a bare surface metal and you would apply this phosphate coating over the top of the metal in order to give it some sort of advantage with mechanical properties such as either paint adhesion or lubricity also can provide some corrosion protection to the part. Um, or some people just wanna have more of a rougher finish on a stock material that these coatings can provide. Gotcha. So today we're, I know there's lots of phosphates. Today we're only gonna talk about two, right? Zinc and manganese and, and kind of talk about, we're gonna compare contrast though. Uh, I think that'd be easier uh, to do it that way because I know a lot of people, uh, you know, use both of them or, or one of them. So this would kind of be a, a primer for the differences and what's best between those. So let's talk generally about each of the coatings uh, and, and where do you see zinc, mag uh, zinc phosphates used and also manganese, uh, manganese phosphate used? Sure. So phosphate in general um, dates back probably to the early 1900s. It was a process known as parkerizing. And from there, kind of two general fields of phosphating kind of became commonplace that would be using either zinc or manganese as basically a, um, a, a metal component in the crystals that you form in order to either strengthen or make those crystals stronger and give the intended properties that you're trying to provide. Um, manganese is, comparing the two, is probably a, it's going to be a thicker, heavier coating weight. Um, it provides you a lot of um, Good lubricity between metals so rather than having two bare pieces of metal when they interact with each other having that galling effect this manganese phosphate crystal that goes onto the surface of the part provides it almost like a cushion of sorts so that way when these two metals interact with each other they you're not having so much of a sheer force on the metal and prevents it from grinding down um, comparing the two zinc on the other hand is going to be similar in terms of the way it's composed on this metal surface, but it's going to be a little bit of a lighter coating weight than manganese in general. Um, zinc phosphates are going to provide you with really good um, good paint adhesion because um, they provide more of a microcrystal structure on the surface of the metal. When I speak of coating weights, coating weights are going to kind of be defined as basically how much crystal you're putting onto the surface of the metal in a pre-designated surface area. So. Most commonly, they're measured in either grams per meter squared or milligrams per uh, foot squared. And those you can kind of convert back between the two. But with, let's say, milligrams per uh, foot squared, you're going to want to have basically, for manganese, you're going to typically have somewhere in the ballpark of uh, 800 to over 2,000 milligrams per foot squared. Whereas with zinc, you're going to tail that down to where you can have as tight of as low as 350 milligrams, kind of going up to about the push in 2000, but probably a little less than 1500. So is that the biggest difference, uh, Connor? Is, that, is it the crystal structure that's the big biggest difference between the two or is that what makes it each unique? Or? Yeah, the crystal structure is gonna be one of the biggest differences. Um, there's a lot of ancillary products that you can kind of use to curtail and hone in to a specific coating weight or specific spec that you may need to fit. Um, typically with zinc, I mean, depending on the part that you're processing and what the application is used for, there's all sorts of specifications that call for different types of either coating weights or even um, coloration. When you're looking at the two, if you're just going to have this bare coating and maybe put an oil over it and you're not necessarily going to paint it, um, the manganese is going to typically yield a darker color than the zinc, whereas manganese is going to give you kind of a dark gray and zinc is going to give you more of a lighter gray finish. Um, just due to the differences between that co-metal that's going to be put into the crystal structure. Gotcha. Gotcha. So uh, let's just talk operationally. How is this chemistry controlled? Uh, what, what are the different ways? Yeah. 
Yeah, so generally you're going to have a heated bath. The zinc phosphates tend to run at an operational temperature of about 180, whereas the manganese need a little bit higher temperature in order to reach an activation point for this reaction to occur. Those typically run between 200 and 210 degrees. Um, both of these reactions are actually very complex in their own right. They have manganese, for example, has close to 20 different competing reactions that all have to take place in equilibrium in order for it to produce the desired coating or the desired crystal that you're trying to achieve. Zinc's a little less complicated, but still is has that delicate balance of an equilibrium in the chemistry in order for it to be a sustained reaction that's going to produce a uniform and um, efficient coating. When we're trying to control these two or both of these processes, there's a couple of different factors that we look at. So both of these are phosphoric acid based products where you have you would measure what we call the, the total acid first and foremost. That's going to basically encapsulate all the phosphoric acid in the multiple different stages that acid can exist in. And that kind of gives you your total concentration of the bath. Another aspect that we look at is what we call a free acid, which is um, basically the first deprotonation of phosphoric acid. And that's going to be what we sometimes refer to as like the biting aspect of it, how quickly this chemistry can attack the bare metal. You're gonna wanna keep this lower, this level lower than you would a total acid. So if let's say we had a bath that has a roughly 12% free acid or total acid, you'd want your free acid to be kind of closer down to like 2% or so. And then with the manganese bath, we also like to monitor what we call the total desire, or excuse me, total dissolved iron content. And that component's basically one of the co-metals that crystallizes in with the manganese and the phosphate and helps produce some of the bulk and some of the, um, the weight that you get from that crystal structure. And there we use um, basically a uh, reducing agent titration to indirectly measure the amount of iron that's dissolved in a bath. If you have too little dissolved in the bath, you're not going to really get the coating weight that you need. Whereas if you go on the other end and you dissolve too much in it, it's gonna really kind of start to degrade the quality of the crystals that you're dissolving or you're coating onto the metal part itself. So uh, Connor, tell us about the heating equipment. Uh, what, what's typical uh, that would be needed uh, for both of these processes? Sure. So um, like I said, these are both um, processes that require a considerable amount of heat in order for you to get the activation energy for these reactions to occur. And um, typically you're going to see that you're going to have your best results and your most consistent coating and uniformity when you have an indirect heating source. So that can either be through um, a steam or a glycol jacketed tank where you have basically your chemistry in a tank, and then that tank is surrounded by a heating jacket that heats up um, a heat transfer fluid. And basically what we're trying to do is minimize this temperature variance between your heating source and the solution that you're heating. When you have too much of a gradient, let's say you were to have just a single steam coil going down and that was producing a whole lot of heat for a large bath, certain parts of the bath are gonna be a lot cooler than that heating coil and that temperature gradient can start to throw a lot of your metrics of the equilibrium out of whack and you have to do extra work in order to get that chemistry back into equilibrium. So the glycol jacket is probably going to be your best bet. Um, or if you're using steam plates or things similar to that, you want to make sure you have a large enough surface area so that heat is being distributed evenly throughout the bath and not localized to one specific area. Gotcha. No, I was going to ask about, uh, you know, I know a lot of finishers like to you know, re refine the grain. Uh, is there a method for, to, for them to actually control the weight, the, the, the crystal structure? Is there a way for that? So manganese phosphate in general is going to be one of the um, heavier applications like we've stated. It also has a wide degree of how much you can influence the coating weight that you're providing. If you were to take just a standard chemistry and take your part, go through a cleaner, rinse, and then into the bath, you could expect to see anywhere from... 1500 to 2500 uh, milligrams per foot square coating weight distributed onto the part. We typically have a lot of specs that kind of either want to narrow that window or want to either even distribute that weight even down to a lower, lower coating weight. So there are a couple of different ways that we can do that. 
One is running that bath constantly. When you don't run your manganese phosphate bath or the zinc phosphate bath with regularity, the longer they sit either at an idle, uh, idle temperature up at operation temp, or if they're not used frequently, they're going to get out of balance and you're going to start getting coating weights that are all over the place. Um, I'm just going to say that's bad. I'm not an expert, but I'm just going to say that's bad. No, that's not good because you want your you want your process to be reproducible and to be efficient and don't want to spend half your time trying to get the chemistry back in order or having to rework parts because all that just leads to wasted dollars, basically. Um, when we look at manganese, so running them efficiently and regularly, whenever you're not using them, cut the heat on them because idle heat drives up the free acid and gets it all out of whack. Another common thing that's used for manganese phosphate is to use what we call grain refiner. Grain refiner is a pre-step of sorts, whereas so you'd go from cleaner into a rinse, and then before going into the manganese bath, you'd use a heated rinse that contains usually a two-part system. You have a basically a pH stabilizer, and then you also have um, a seeding chemistry that basically takes the surface of the metal and seeds it with um, activation sites. And when it goes into the manganese, or when it goes into the phosphate bath, instead of having really large individual crystals, you have more in terms of the number of crystals that are actually developing and growing, but then they get crowded out spatially. So the crystals kind of grow to a smaller size and give you an overall more uniform coating, but also a lighter coating weight. An analogy I kind of used to describe this, and bear with me if it doesn't make sense, but um, if you were to take like a, a driveway and you were to cover the driveway with a bunch of large boulders, that would be kind of similar to the coating that you're going to get when you don't use a grain refiner. You're going to have large, uh, gotcha. large chunks of this manganese phosphate crystal that develop. But if you were to instead kind of seed it, seed that surface ahead of time, think of it, you would now have gravel being laid evenly over that driveway surface. So you have a lot more individual crystals, but they're kind of being constrained and the size that they can grow. So you get them a lot more densely packed in there. This provides you, like I said, with the lower coating weight, but also gives you more um, corrosion protection in terms because you don't have as much of that bare surface exposed. Right. So so there is, like I said, there is a, some physical property changes when you do the uh, refining and everything. But so, but how, how's this process kept really in optimal uh, condition? What type of um, maintenance is required? What, what should the, the finisher and coder be looking at to keep it, uh, mm -hmm. keep everything running smoothly with that. Sure. So with both of them, um, we typically recommend that you're going to titrate your metrics daily. You really kind of want to have a firm grasp of where your bath stands prior to you putting any parts in there. So that would include um, titrating the total and the free acid that like we said, those are simple acid based titrations. If you're using a manganese bath, you'll want to also look at the dissolved iron content that's in them. Um, on a regular basis. And from there, there's certain um, additions or uh, manipulations that you can take on these chemistries in order to get them back in check. If you have for a zinc or a manganese bath, your free acid has gone too high, you'll want to add peroxide to it to kind of lower that free acid down. And that's going to do it disproportionately lowering the free acid to the total acid that you're going to use. So you'd want to make that addition and then you'll have to maybe add a little bit of chemistry back to kind of get you back in range. Right. Okay. So like I said, is that what you're talking about when you're talking about bath maintenance or, or is there anything else that people can do with like uh, to keep the solution active, solution active uh, mm -hmm. or in, using any proactive measures? That's what you're speaking of is there more that they could be doing? Yeah. So um, you do have to make additions to the bath typically, and especially for a new bath when you make them up, one of the things people are going to want to do is kind of use a, we call like a sacrificial bat batch that's going to run through there. And really when you're processing parts, that's how you keep those chemistries in the best um, equilibrium and processing more parts gets you more uniform results. So you'll want to take like a, a sacrificial load, run it through the chemistry, and that will help kind of get everything back in balance where it needs to be. Because oftentimes with your first batch that you run through, you're not going to get what you need or what you expect that bath to be able to perform at, even if all of your metrics are correct. So Connor, how critical is, is cleaning in this process prior to phosphate? I mean, it gets a little tricky with that, but in the pre-treatment, but talk about that a little bit, especially as it relates to uh, phosphates. Yeah. So, um, 
course, like with many other coatings, you want to make sure you have as clean of a surface as possible prior to doing any of the phosphating on the surface of the parts. Um, common issues that we see that contribute to quality issues in terms of the coating that you end up achieving would be just improper cleaning. Both of these processes, we typically would recommend that you have a caustic cleaner. It's going to be able to fully remove any of the soils, organic or inorganic, from the surface of the part. Um, with the inorganic soils, the higher pH is able to kind of remove those so you get down to that bare surface. And occasionally you may even need to do an acid pickle after you do your cleaning step mm. if you have a lot of heat treat scale or other um, contributing factors that will prevent that coating from adhering to the surface and making a more uniform coating. In terms of organics, we also want to minimize any of the, of course, we want to remove any of the organics that are on the surface of the metal. But we also really want to be sure that we're preventing those contaminants from being carried downstream into that phosphating bath because when you put the organics into a acid chemistry, it's just going to create a big mess. Um, if you're using a, particularly for barrel processes, you really want to have that caustic cleaner be emulsifying. So that way you don't have that oil skim sitting at the top of the bath. And those oils are really able to kind of blend into the solution and not be re-adhered to the surface of the parts when you're pulling it out of the solution. Um, I'd also recommend usually with the rinses that you have some sort of counterflow rinse so that way you're able to really minimize any of the carryover contamination on the parts going into either your pre-phosphate, your pre-dip basically, or into the active phosphate chemistry. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, is there any uh, post-treatment concerns? Uh, we talked pre-treatment, but post-treatment with this uh, that's uh, unique? Sure. So. Like I said, these coatings in general provide you with a good bit of um, anti-corrosion protection and some of the mechanical properties that we talked about earlier. You can augment the properties of that coating that you provided by using a sealant or post dip, such as either water soluble or water based, uh, or excuse me, water soluble or um, water displacing oil on the surface. And since you've provide, since you've put that sort of um, rough grit coating on the surface of the parts, it really is able to absorb a lot of that oil and um, kind of amplify those mechanical advantages that you get from the coating itself. And it's a rather absorbent, or absorbent coating as well, since you have a lot more of the cavities that the oil is able to kind of get down into and really soak it in, and provide you some long-term benefits. Okay. Well, you know, and like you said, we're going to do another, uh, podcast talking about other phosphates, correct? I think iron, correct? Or is there, yeah. uh, it, with, with those, uh, but there's a lot out there. And it really, I think part of that discussion we should have is, or we could have it now really is, is, uh, you know, what, what should finishers be looking for? What, what would make the difference for them of which, which phosphate they would be using? Is it just yeah. sort of spec'd out for them or is it, uh, yeah, typically the, um, the actual chemistry or the approach that you're going to use, if it's not, a part of a certain specification is really going to be application specific. So when we're talking about these more conventional methods like the zinc and the manganese, those are going to be used for when you need a heavier coating weight or a heavier coating in general, that's either going to provide you with the corrosion resistance or the mechanical properties that those are intended to be used for. When we're looking at more of a pre-paint aspect, while you tend to use zinc over manganese, you can also use some more lighter coating weight methods that still give you a good um, surface adhesion, such as the iron phosphates, or even a newer method would be with the zirconium base prepaint products. Right, right. Uh, and is there, you know, because we hear phosphates a lot with uh, waste treatment. I mean, are there big issues with those, or are those pretty much able to control those pretty easily, the waste treatment? We are seeing more and more that phosphates are becoming more regulated with different wastewater treatment and POTWs. So we would kind of would be a little bit more specific to the um, region or locale that you're working with. Right. It can be done. It can be done, but it's, it's got to follow it properly. Right. Yeah. And there's definitely um, treatment chemistries that can be used in order to make sure that whatever you're discharging is within the limits that you may have set for your region. Gotcha. So we talked a little bit about the changing the coating weight of magnesium phosphate. 
so what type of variations uh, can occur with the, uh, the zinc chemistry uh, in the zinc process? Sure. So unlike the manganese process where we use a pre-dip to kind of narrow in what sort of coating what we're trying to achieve, with the zinc phosphate chemistries, we more so would change out the actual chemistry that's being used. So you have your traditional zinc phosphate chemistry, which um, for us would be the, our MyFos Z2. Um, if we wanted to kind of achieve a lower coating weight, we would use either um, our MyFos Z10 or Z1500. Those are both going to be calcium modified um, chemistries. So if you wanted to curtail the coating weight to be a little bit lower and give you a tighter crystal structure, we would use one of our calcium modified products, which would be either the MyFos Z10 or the MyFos Z1500. Um, those products are made using what's referred to as the French process, where you kind of use calcium or lime as a um, factor in the blending of those chemistries, and they help modify the crystal structures so that it's kind of narrowed down. On the other end of that, we would we also have a very heavy zinc phosphate um, chemistry. We call it the MyFos Z4000. And that is a little different in that it kind of behaves more like the manganese chemistry and provides really large crystal structures to the surface of the metal. Um, this process is kind of uh, niche in its application. It's going to be used only in cases where you need a really, really heavy coating weight because it's not the most um, uniform and it's not the prettiest of coating weights that you can pr provide on the surface. And then alternatively, kind of combining the two, there's also... Um, chemistries that use a, a blend of zinc and manganese together and they kind of combine the benefits of each other. You get a slightly lower coating weight than your manganese, but you're going to get more of the anti-galling properties that the manganese provides. So when you blend the zinc and the manganese as two co-metals in together, you can kind of get that uh, middle ground between the two. Okay. Well, great. Well, this is great looking at uh, zinc and magnes magnesium uh, phosphate. And like I said, well, our next I guess we'll be looking at uh, some others and uh, including iron, but uh, Connor, thank you very much for giving us all that expertise. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. And we'll join us again on Seen and Solved. Seen and Solved is brought to you by Hubbard Hall. Better results, less chemistry. For more podcasts, go to HubbardHall.com or wherever you get your podcasts.